From the Missouri School of Journalism, welcome to Global Journalist. I'm Jason McClure. We're going to talk today about an issue that has long been the subject of science fiction, but is closer than ever to becoming a reality. That's the development of so-called killer robots by militaries around the world. Now, the phrase killer robots might bring to mind Arnold Schwarzenegger and the Terminator, or the Autobots and Decepticons battling it out in the Transformers movies. But we're not really talking about human humanoid robots like C-3PO. Instead, the issue is about autonomous weapon systems, or weapons that use artificial intelligence to target and kill a presumed enemy. These might be weapons that look more like a drone, or a small submarine, or even a driverless car. Now, this issue has set off a lively ethical debate. A number of well-known scientists and entrepreneurs have come out against the development of killer robots. These include the likes of Apple co-founder Steve Wozniak, Tesla's Elon Musk, and Nobel Prize-winning physicist Stephen Hawking. Others say that in some cases, computers might make better decisions in warfare than humans and save lives in the process. In a few minutes, we'll hear from a panel of guests who have been following this issue closely. But first, to tell us more about the use of robotics in warfare, we're going to bring in Joel Esposito. He's a professor of weapons and systems engineering at the U.S. Naval Academy. He joins us from Annapolis, Maryland. Joel, welcome. Thanks for having me. Well, if you could, just to start, tell us how is it exactly that we should define this idea of killer robots or autonomous weapon systems? Well, I think the right way to think about it is these things are on a continuum. There's not, um, it's not a black or white issue. So these days, almost every major weapon system used in modern warfare has a computer that controls parts of those systems. So if you think about a fighter jet and you think about um, the autopilot that that uses, there's a computer that's controlling parts of that jet. I think where the issue becomes uh, more interesting is when the computer decision making is directly involved in the weapon system or, or the lethal component of that action. And so this is when it comes to the decision as to whether or not to use lethal, lethal force to fire a missile, to pull the trigger on a gun, something of that nature. That's not something that currently occurs anywhere in the world. Well, um, so. The way that this works right now is for, for most of the weapon systems used by the United States at this time, uh, there's a human in the loop at all times. So that system, so for example, the Predator drone may take off and land by itself. It may be able to navigate to a waypoint by itself, but there's still a person there making the decision to fire, selecting the targets, and ready to intervene at any time if things go awry. So... The Predator, you said it can take off by itself, it can land by itself, it can get to the area where the target is. There's still a human being sort of doing the click to fire, if you will, uh, to make the decision to launch a missile at an enemy uh, or presumed enemy force then. That's exactly right. And well, what are some uh, other technologies only, that, that are similar to this then, that are sort of near autonomous or are kind of these precursors to, to killer robots? Well... The only area in the military uh, where we really truly have autonomous firing is in defensive weapons that are used against non-human targets. So if you think about air defense systems against missiles or um, uh, large aircraft carriers and want to be able to defend themselves against incoming artillery, they have a weapon system on there that is fully autonomous. Uh, it's essentially a machine gun on a unit that can swivel and aim using radar much faster than a human operator could do it. Um, but again, there's very specific rules laid down by the Department of Defense on that. They're only used in defensive situations and against non-human targets. So shooting down missiles would be the best example. Well, you know, I think when a lot of people start talking about this issue, they do think of what they have seen in pop culture and science fiction. They think of the Terminator, uh, of... Uh, HAL from Space Odyssey 2000, some things like this. We're not really talking about humanoid robots so much now, or is that that's something that's under development as well by the military? Uh, humanoid development is, is something that's in its infancy right now. So this is something that uh, people are interested in, not, not only for combat use, but for rescue work. Think about Fukushima and um, the environment that you had to navigate there. But these are really in the early stages. In fact, recently DARPA, uh, the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, had a competition 
um, for humanoid robots trying to do some basic tasks, opening a door, turning a valve, firefighting type things. And the results are, they're pretty comical. If, if you go and look at it on the web there, they're kind of a, 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 you know, it's at the level of a toddler perhaps. So that's more in the distant future. What we're seeing right now is more uh, vehicles that have been adapted from manned to unmanned status. So things like the Predator drone, an aircraft, uh, things like perhaps um, an unmanned ground vehicle, which might look like a tank or a Jeep. That's really what the realm of, of technology is in today. Well, it sounds like then there are some sort of military tasks that robots might be better suited for than others. What, what sorts of things would robots be good at? What sorts of things would they be not so good at? Well, that, that's a great question. It's important to understand that. Um, so one of the things that robots are excellent at is they have excellent endurance. So many human accidents, you, you can think about driving a car, many accidents are caused by humans having fatigue, um, perhaps boredom and getting distracted. Uh, and that's where accidents and mistakes happen. Robots, on the other hand, can do things for very, very long periods of time, really only limited by their fuel source. So if you have an application where you want to surveil a city, for example, for hours and hours on end, perhaps you're waiting for someone to leave a building, you can put an unmanned system in the air there, not an armed one, um, but one with cameras fitted on it. It can circle and loiter there for hours on end without getting tired. So that's one example um, with endurance. Uh, the other thing is the robots can have very fast reaction time. So in the case of that uh, air defense system I was talking about, it's probably not possible for a human to have the coordination reaction time to shoot down an incoming missile that's coming at twice the speed of sound. Um, but a computer controlled system can do those things. So it can enhance our coordination and our endurance. And what sorts of guidelines has the U.S. military developed? What do they tell these researchers at DARPA, the sort of research arm of the Defense Department, and others about what, what we should be doing with killer robots and what we should not be doing? Well, as, as I said before, there's a DOD directive uh, that states that at this time for, for strike or offensive capability, only semi-autonomous weapon systems are approved, which means that a human will decide uh, the target selection and when to fire. The only approval of autonomous weapon systems is for defensive purposes against non-human targets. So that that's, that's from high up there. That's um, a directive that's probably not likely to change anytime soon. Uh, as you go down to the lower level, I think what they're trying to find is the missions where it makes the most sense to do that. And the, one of the big ones right now is reconnaissance. Um, another one is um, anti-submarine warfare. Um, so these are situations that's kind of perceived as low-hanging fruit. Situation might be easier to, to automate um, because things are relatively simple out in the open ocean or up in the air. Much more complicated to do something like urban combat or any kind of um, uh, close quarters fighting. It's a much more complicated situation to automate. And Joel, our time does grow short, but tell us briefly, if you would, what do we know about what other countries are doing in this field? Well, um, we know that other countries have had unmanned aerial vehicles for a long time. In fact, the Israelis really pioneered that. And certainly we should expect that Russia and China and so forth have a pretty similar capability to what we have. What we know a little bit less about is uh, their their willingness to, to arm those vehicles and, and how humans uh, uh, control the, the so-called kill chain, the decision to fire. Well, Joel Esposito, thanks so much for joining us. Well, thanks for having me. A reminder that you're listening to Global Journalist. I'm Jason McClure. We're talking today about the development of killer robots and the debate about the use of artificial intelligence in warfare. We just spoke with Joel Esposito, a weapons and systems engineer at the U.S. Naval Academy. Now to expand our discussion, we're going to bring in three other experts. Joining us from Washington, D.C. is Paul Schar. He's the director of the Future of Warfare Initiative at the Center for New American Security. We're also joined from Washington by Sharon Weinberger, a journalist who reports on science in the military, is author of the new book called The Imagineers of War, The Untold Story of DARPA, the Pentagon Agency that Changed the World. And our final guest is Stephen Goose. He's the director of the Arms Division at Human Rights Watch, the group that coordinates a campaign to stop killer robots. 
Welcome to all of you. Sharon Weinberger, let me start with you. In general, a lot of people are uncomfortable with the idea that robots, that computers could be making life and death decisions about whether or not to fire a weapon at a human being on the battlefield. Is, are, are these fears justified? Well, whether justified or not, it really goes back to pop culture. So take, for example, in the 1980s, when DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, started a billion-dollar initiative in artificial intelligence. Well, this unfortunately coincided with a couple of different Cold War movies. Um, for instance, War Games, which was the idea of a computer, sort of artificial intelligence, starting a nuclear war. And then we had Terminator, which really sort of cemented in American culture this fear of sort of a, a, a humanoid robot with artificial intelligence. So whether justified or not, this is part of our thinking that we have been traditionally very uncomfortable with the idea of, of an autonomous armed robot. And you wrote a whole book on DARPA, this part of the Pentagon that develops new weapons. What's your sense of how the uniformed military thinks about this? Obviously, if you're a soldier who's going into combat with bullets coming at you, you might welcome the idea of having robots perform you know, very hazardous tasks. Well, certainly. I think a big push of robotics in the Pentagon, and certainly from DARPA, is use robots and robotic vehicle in places where you have the potential for high casualties. So, for instance, um, DARPA in the mid-2000s sponsored this series of races called the Grand Challenge for autonomous cars. And part of the thinking was convoys in Iraq and Afghanistan being hit by improvised explosive devices this would be a perfect opportunity to have robotic vehicles. You know, what, what I sort of um, am sometimes confused by in the campaign against quote-unquote killer robots is you don't see a lot of advocacy from the Pentagon or Pentagon officials for autonomous armed ground vehicles. Um, I, I don't see people advocating in the Pentagon for taking the human out of the loop. Well... Tell me, if you would, how, how is it that we should think about making rules or regulations around the use of killer robots? Because it does seem like the technology is moving very fast, perhaps faster than our sort of regulatory infrastructure has been able to make rules about it. I mean, if you think a century ago, ago one of our producers found online, uh, there was an Ambrose Beer story about a chess-playing robot, which at the time seemed outlandish. Now, obviously, the, the world's greatest human grandmaster can't, can't beat a supercomputer. Um, and even a decade or so, robots would have had a hard time like recognizing a man with a rifle. Now it seems they can do that. So how is it that we can make regulations that are going to keep pace with uh, the speed of this technology? Well, I think, first of all, we have to take a little bit of hype out of the campaign. I think this campaign against killer robots conflates so many things. Are we talking about robotics? Are we talking about artificial intelligence? Because, again, this is not something new. If you take us back to the Vietnam battlefield in 1968, where the first time you had computer systems calculating coordinates to pass to aircraft to, take, to make strikes against targets, well, this is a form of semi-automated killing. So again, I, I think the campaign against killer robots needs to decide what actually is it that you're concerned about. You know, a landmine is an autonomous killing system. It, it takes the man out of the loop. It's designed to kill people. Um, and to detect when a person or something that it wants to target is in its presence. So I, I think that's part of what needs to be addressed. What sorts of regulations, what is it you're really concerned about, and what do you want to regulate? Well, let me turn this then to Stephen Goose of Human Rights Watch, uh, the human rights group that has uh, helped form this campaign to stop killer robots. Go ahead and, if you would, address those points that Sharon raised. Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, we are not against... Autonomy, we're not against artificial intelligence. What we think is that you can't, you should not cross the line to where you have a fully autonomous weapon system, a system that no longer has meaningful human control over key combat functions, that is the targeting and the kill decisions. Uh, we are talking about future weapons, not existing weapons. Fortunately, landmines have already been comprehensively banned by uh, most of the world's nations. Um, but we're looking at systems that do uh, use artificial intelligence to make those key combat decisions. 
And so, in other words, then, if we go back to our discussion of the Predator drone that has been used in Yemen and Somalia in various places, then that's able to take off, land, find uh, certain locations on its own. You're saying that the sort of current limit where a human still has to be in the loop to click to shoot the missile or the weapon that's going to kill the presumed enemy, you're saying that that sort of meets your group's threshold then? Yes, you want to keep the human in the loop. There are also systems that they talk about where you have humans on the loop where it's just supervisory in nature, and those need to be looked at very carefully. But where you have a human in the loop, where you have meaningful human control over targeting and kill decisions, that, uh, that is, is the, the basic line that we do not want crossed. And Paul Shar, if I could turn this to you, you were an Army Ranger and did multiple tours in Afghanistan and Iraq, and now you research the uses of this technology. So from your perspective, how might autonomous weapons, killer robots, how might they perform in the places where you fought? I think, you know, in the types of um, those kinds of combat environments where you have civilians nearby, those are the most challenging possible environments. Um, to envision weapons. When you think about a lot of the things that militaries are talking about, they're really talking about um, things that might target objects, like submarines or radars or ships, and maybe in environments where there are not civilians present. So in other words, then, sort of the existing types of wars that the U.S. has been involved in over the past 15 years, these are actually some of the most challenging environments for robotics to operate in. I mean, they're challenging environments for people. So, you know, there are lots of ambiguous situations in the kinds of uh, messy guerrilla wars that we see today where people are not wearing uniforms, where it might be hard to tell whether someone is actually... Uh, a valid enemy combatant or a civilian might depend on their behavior. You know, if someone's approaching a group of soldiers at a checkpoint and they don't stop, are they someone who's just confused or do they have a suicide vest underneath their jacket? So those are, those are hard problems for people. Um, I think they would be very challenging for robotic systems or uh, maybe to be more precise for machine intelligence, artificial intelligence based on the state of the technology today, but there may be other situations um, in maybe simpler environments, such as under sea or in the air, that might be you. And uh, if I could turn this back to you, uh, Sharon Weinberger, um, w tell us just a little bit about what your response is. I think Stephen Goose said that, you know, the main issue uh, with killer robots is this final kill decision. Is this something then, like, where you would draw a bright line that ultimately there has to be a human in the loop before a lethal weapon is used against a human being? Um, I, you know, let me put it this way. I guess I'm concerned about a discussion which focuses so much on sort of a red line of whether or not a computer is in the loop. I guess my question is, shouldn't we be more concerned about the end result of civilian casualties? So picking up the discussion, if we look, for example, the killing of civilians at set points in Iraq, um, which in the early days of the war, there, there were many, I mean, there were almost countless tragic cases. What exactly is it we're concerned with? So if the end concern is civilian casualties, then shouldn't we be discussing um, whether artificial intelligence is better or worse than that than a man in the loop. I'm not by any means an advocate for taking a man outside of the loop, but I guess I would like to at least have that discussion of what exactly is the concern. I think the concern should be civilian casualties. You're listening to Global Journalist. I'm Jason McClure. On today's show, we're talking about the development of killer robots for use in warfare. We're joined by Paul Schar of the Center for New American Security, Stephen Goose of Human Rights Watch, and Sharon Weinberger, a journalist and author of the book The Imagineers of War, the untold story of DARPA, the Pentagon agency that changed the world. If you're interested in more Global Journalist, you can visit our website, globaljournalist.org, There, you can access our archives and find our ongoing reports on undercovered international news and human rights issues. You can also read our continuing series on journalists forced into exile around the world. 
In addition, you can like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, or subscribe to the program on YouTube or iTunes. Stephen Goose, let me turn this back to you then. One of the major reasons your group opposes these weapons, as I understand it, is the issue of accountability. And Sharon Weinberger raises this issue of civilian deaths in warfare. How do you, how do you sort of think about that issue? Yeah, well, <clears throat> she's right. The, 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 the key should be. Um, concerns about civilian casualties. I mean, there is a fundamental ethical issue here that goes beyond civilian casualties, and that is whether or not you should cede life and death decision making to uh, to robots, to non-human uh, entities. Uh, but once you get beyond that fundamental ethical issue, it is about protecting civilians and, and trying to ensure there are not uh, increased civilian casualties, even catastrophic numbers of civilian casualties as a result <clears throat> of these. Paul raised a couple of different scenarios, and they all point to uh, serious concerns about the ability of fully autonomous weapons to be able to comply with international humanitarian law, with the laws of war, or with international human rights law. Can they distinguish combatants from civilians? Can they make the proportionality assessment, where for each individual attack you have to determine whether or not the danger to civilians outweighs the military benefit? These are subjective determinations that it's highly unlikely uh, that are going to be solved by artificial intelligence. And so if Paul, you can't comply with the laws of war, you're going to end up with a lot of civilian casualties. And Paul Shar, if I could turn this back to you, you worked at the office of the Secretary of Defense and were involved in the drafting of some of the current guidelines the Pentagon uses for the development of killer robots. What, what were some of the stickier issues for you? Well, I think... Um, you know, the hardest challenge here is that we don't really know how the technology is evolving. So we can see that it's changing quickly. Um, we can see what the technology is today, but it's very hard to predict forward what it might look like in two years, much less 20 years. And, um, you know, if you look at just say self-driving cars, for example, right, well, you know, what's the timeline in which we'll have a car that is better than humans in a wide variety of settings? I don't know the answer to that. The answer might be 10 years away. The answer might be we already have it, and we just we don't realize it yet. We need to get them out in the field and, and drive them, and, and they'll, they actually are better than us now. So, I, you know, one of the underlying challenges here in this conversation is how do we approach new technologies in war? Steve outlined a number of different principles in the laws of war that are agnostic to technology. They're about distinguishing between civilians and enemy combatants, their proportionality, those do not hinge on specific technology. So those laws are there no matter what technologies come along, whether it's AI or laser weapons or something else. You know, one of the challenges is then as new technologies come along and as they're changing, do we trust that the laws of war can handle those? Or do we try to create ad hoc regulations to manage them as countries have for some specific weapons in the past? And, well, let me ask you this then. This directive that has been in place for almost five years now at the Department of Defense sort of basically saying humans have to be in the loop on any lethal attack decision. That directive is up for renewal this year by the Secretary of Defense, by President Trump. Paul, what, what do we know about their thinking on this issue? Yeah, I, I doubt um, probably bubbled up to the level of the, the White House yet. I mean, I, I think that the policy that's in place at the Pentagon is really designed actually to be more like a framework that is flexible to adapt to technology as it changes because it's moving so quickly. So it doesn't really have any ironclad rules that sort of outlines what's possible today and what's approved today, but then it creates an internal process within the Department of Defense to review new ideas and new weapon systems as they come along and to either approve them or modify them. So, you know, it doesn't say hard and fast, you can't do anything. It sort of lays out a process by which engineers and military professionals and testers can get together and debate these issues as they come along. Well, and Stephen Goose, Paul earlier raised the point about the sort of nature of how quickly the technology is changing, and he acknowledged sort of the the, the linchpin of all this is sort of the laws of war. Um, but at some point, if an average 
robot computerized soldier or weapon system can make better decisions than an average human soldier. Uh, humans obviously have been involved in many different atrocities over history and warfare. Is it, should we, re, you know, would you reassess your position? Well, <clears throat> I, I personally think that the ethical issue trumps everything else, so I would not change my position. There are others who might look at it differently, but from our point of view, that kind of just sort of let's hope for the best and see what happens is, is, is an irresponsible approach to this issue. There are so many reasons to object to fully autonomous weapons, ethical reasons, legal reasons, proliferation, fears about what this means for international security, all of those things taken together, any one of which would be powerful enough to, to support a, a ban call, but take them all together and it really would be irresponsible to just see what happens, see if we can do it. And Sharon Weinberger, I wanted to get your take on this issue of accountability because it seems like this is a sticky issue if you do have computers making these decisions about life and death. If, you, if a person makes a mistake within militaries, within sort of international law, there's supposed to be sort of clear repercussions for violating the laws of war. But if you flip a switch on a robot and it goes out and does something unexpected or somehow violates one of these laws, commits an atrocity, how how do you hold the people, how do you hold anyone accountable for that? Well, let me back up for a second because I think it's important to state one thing. There is no higher ethical issue than protection of civilians. I don't know how one divorce the two. Um, it doesn't exist in a vacuum. Um, as for accountability, you know, all errors in the end are human errors. If you And, and again, I'm not an advocate for artificial intelligence um, in warfare or taking humans out of the loop. But in the end, if you program something wrong such that it kills someone, that, that is a human error. So I guess, again, I, I would rather, I, I feel like the debate about killer robots is so almost science fiction focused, as opposed to bringing the debate down to what matters, which is, you know, the killing of innocents in warfare. That, that is a much higher ethical issue than whether you think it's done by an algorithm or a human in the loop. And Paul Shar, there has been some publicity recently about Russia's development of unmanned ground systems. It sounds like unmanned tanks or jeeps. What, what do we know about the status of their technology? Because obviously they may be making different calculations about how to develop this technology than, than the U.S. Yeah, they certainly are. Russia is building a fleet of armed ground robotic systems of various sizes, up to and including a small um, unmanned robotic tank. Um, while the leaders in the DOD have been fairly equivocal about this idea of uh, autonomous weapons, they've said, really, they're not that interested in it, but, and they want to keep the person in the loop, but maybe someday if other countries go there, they might have to respond and they'll reevaluate. The Russians have had a completely different tone. Um, they've said, you know, we want to build fully robotic units. Um, now, they have not come out and said, well, we will definitely build autonomous weapons, but they certainly haven't expressed the same sort of level of hesitation. Um, I, I do want to follow quickly on this question about accountability, though. This, I actually think it's a bit of a red herring. As Sharon mentioned, you know, the key question is about intentionality versus accident. So if a person does something intentionally and it kills civilians, and it's disproportionate or it's targeted at civilians, that's a war crime. And it doesn't matter whether that, that's done with a rifle or with a robot. If it's an accident and the person didn't mean to kill civilians, it's not a crime. It might be terrible, it might be tragic, um, that military is still responsible for what happened, but it's not a crime. That's going to have to do it for this edition of Global Journalist, a production of the Missouri School of Journalism and KBIA Mid-Missouri Public Radio. Many thanks to Joel Esposito, Paul Schar, Stephen Goose, and Sharon Weinberger for joining us. Our producers this week are Jin Hong Chen and Rachel Foster Gimbel, and our visual editor is Alyssa Blyle. For all of us at Global Journalist, I'm Jason McClure. Thanks for tuning in. <laughs>